Eric Hem and a couple of other people just stayed on for hours, like hours. It was quite amazing. Welcome one and all. Uh, I will keep this very brief. We all know why we're here. We've all been here before. Um, and if you guys want to, uh, Jackie's, uh, Jackie, this is the first time you've come. Yes, but welcome, great. Um, and uh, I just, um, well, since we're all here and I get to say something different and we know it, uh, just so you know, um, uh, all of us in the curatorial panel are trying to figure out what season 2B is going to look like, or season 3, or the second half of season 2. Um, to be, not to be, I was like making a lot of jokes about that earlier. <laughs> but um, we're going to take a little gap and then basically try and do another 20 back-to-back -back sessions. Uh, maybe come August, September, Falguni, our resident overlord is going to see to it that we come up with a plan. Um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, uh, Frank, it's you running a talk, right? Next, uh, in the coming, yes. And you're running it with, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And you've got, I know you've got one of my co-fellows, Madhu Natraj on the talk, and that's also beautiful. Um, so really keen to, um, really keen to see if we can do more of those. So, you know, Kamili is here. I mean, I'm going to do, I'm going to sit back at Kamili's talk and let Abhishek and Kamili talk about Thomas. That's the plan. Uh, um, so that's, that's the talk with Kamili. Um, but it's clearly that uh, a lot of the ongoing participants, the ongoing conversationalists are coming back and talking uh, and having ideas for conversations. So the more of those can happen. Um, I think it's really time that we start a, a, a group of people who think about how we can take this knowledge creation and turn it into small micro actions everywhere and how that can then turn maybe into movements later on. Um, I know that my own personal quest is to imagine a whole new para institution, um, which uh, you know is tentatively titled Banyan, um, where we try and figure out a, a, a theater making organization for the future, for a future kind of theater's role in society, which is seems to have less and less to do with uh, the stage and the black box, and much more to do with all the things that theater can do once you have trained in the stage in the black box. So I will leave it at that and uh, keep coming back and keep going to the knowledge creation that is happening on the website. And Ngeni, Jaki, all yours, welcome. Thank you, Jehan, and hello, everyone. Good to see you again. Um, yeah, I'm super excited about this conversation. Um, I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Jackie Jo. Um, from the CCDPS, um, and I'm going to hand over to Jackie to briefly introduce herself <laughs> and just tell us a little about who you are, um, and then we'll we'll jump straight into the conversation. Which, although you know, I want to flag that that um, it, it's very clearly kind of framed initially as a as a conversation around dance practice specifically, but my hope is that um, our hope rather is that. Um, dance as a window into thinking more broadly about bodily practices, right? So, so not text-based theater or performance-based work, but about how, how, how working through the body um, kind of compels us to engage and possibly uh, kind of work in ways that allows us to step across or dance across um, kind of the various fault lines um, that kind of separate us and, and of the world that we live in. Um, yeah, so even though we're, 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 we're taking off from, from dance as our initial footing, I'm hoping that we'll quite swiftly kind of open up to, to the many different people in this room who I know um, kind of work through the body, um, whether that's in terms of the car or physical theatre or any number of other ways, um, to kind of address the core questions that we're grappling with today. Um, Jackie, over to okay. you. I thought you were going to introduce me, but thank oh, you. Oh, no, no, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I'm the host, Jackie. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. My name is Jackie. Um, I am uh, a senior lecturer in the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies. And uh, I have primarily, I come from a dance background. I am a, uh, I dance, I saw, I make work, I perform. I teach and one of the interests, um, uh, something that's really ameliorated my practice and my philosophy of the body over the last few years, is I incorporate Bhutto principles into, into, my, um, 
into my teaching and into my philosophy of the body. Um, brief introduction. Yeah, so just Mungeni was saying how it's true, you know, to want to move across from, move away from just sticking to the, the dancing body and how we bend our knees and jump, roll and turn. Um, it's what really interests me about the body is, um, and I think that really animates my practice is that one of the, I think, fundamental pillars of the way I think is, is that I like to think of, of my body as, um, as not just this body, not just not limited by the the class or racial or gender distinctions that we you know the kind of way we, we signify bodies but my what really animates me is is the the sense that um my body is energized by inside what's inside outside and around me and all of these different elements and difference here being very important word um all of these different elements kind of interpenetrate and and create something that's much larger than any part in itself and much larger than just what this body seems to signify um and so um, and I find that very exciting um, and it kind of gives me the <laughs> the imagination that I can carry on performing for a long, long time still because um, that there's not like a sell by date, you know, for um, for this body, um, because it's not just this body. And yeah, I guess that's that's kind of a, a broad introduction to to um, yeah, where I'm at right now and in, in response to um, Ongeni's introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, yeah, um, we'll on this dance. yeah, so I'm not sure how familiar people in the room are with <laughs> what's happening in South Africa right now. Um, you know, even in, in preparing for this conversation, um, I was certainly confronted by a question that keeps on returning to me over and over again. Um, there's this kind of massive crisis, and I'll tell you a little about it now, going on outside and trying to make sense of what it means to be sitting in a space of art making, of in, in the midst of doing things that seem frivolous, for want of a better word, in the context of the kind of real pressing, urgent things that are happening immediately outside our front doors. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'd like to circle back to that idea, but just a bit of context for those who don't know. Um, since Wednesday, Thursday, Friday last week, um, there have been massive protests around South Africa, um, initially in response to the imprisonment of former President Jacob Zuma on um, content of court charges handed down by the Constitutional Court, so it's our apex court. Um, 15 month imprisonment, there were protests um, about his imprisonment. Um, and those rapidly escalated into, um, you know, protests around service delivery and various other things, opportunism, just rank criminality. Um, but there's been this massive looting on a scale we've never seen um, of warehouses, of shops, of malls being burnt down. It's, it's probably crazy out there. So with all of this going down over the past week, I'm sitting here thinking, oh God, I have to sit down and have a conversation about, you know, how dance <laughs> and about how performance and art helps us move across these imagined fault lines. And, you know, watching somebody who is empowered by all the apparatuses of the state, the national president, having to beg practically people to control themselves, to behave, um, makes me recognize that even with all of those instruments of power at, at, at his disposal, um, very little substantive capacity to change things immediately, right? So how much more so us in our little studios, in our homes and in our little spaces um, in relation you know, to, to these big problems that are playing out outside? So I, I, I really struggle, I think, often with, with, with locating myself ethically in relation to what's going on outside um, and the work that we do. But I think something that I've found useful is to lean into that very simple question instead of running away from it. So in this context is why, why dance, why make art? What, what's the, you know, <laughs> if, if one can defend the, the seeming frivolity of what we do to what ends, right? 
Um, and I think that there's some use, something generative in, in rehearsing the things that we, we think um, are of value and that we have to offer um, and being quite clear in naming what it is that we think we are doing when we engage in this art making. So Jackie, I mean, to throw that back to you um, and also to anyone else in the room who may you know, have anything to offer here, but how do we make sense of, of, of what we do and, and its capacity to effect real change in the world um, in the context of these seemingly insuperable kind of um, conflicts that we have to engage in every day without uh, I'm, romanticizing what we do either, right? Exactly. Yeah, no, it's a very, very important question, you know, and um, at the beginning of the year, um, I had in January, I had when we were in our second wave year of COVID. Um, and at that time, in the, um, when we were experiencing the second wave in my immediate circle, I was, it, it felt very close to me. There were many people ill. There were many people that I knew that had died, et cetera, et cetera. And, and at the same time, I was putting on a live stream um, film that I had made of me prancing around as a praying mantis. And you go like, seriously? Um, uh, I'm Jackie's been quite literal there. <laughs> you know, um, how do I, how do I justify this? How do I go and sit and go, welcome to this show um, when we know that we are experiencing such heartache um, um, right, right next to us, right off screen. And, and then I, I was thinking, you know, like you said, like lean into what it is we're doing. And the, 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 the idea of presence became quite, I, I really started thinking about that. Um, as I said before, the idea that it's not, I'm not just my body, but there are all these multiple elements into play all the time. So other than my being present, as in you see me in this space now, this particular body in a particular time, there's also this presence of the things that are invisible. And, and, and that is carried through the practice. And so, and, and, um, and that comes through. It's about making that invisible visible in other ways, other than the toy toy and other than these all robust ways of saying that we are being activistic and that we are acknowledging all the things that's going on in the world. But there are multiple ways of doing that too and we can do it through our practice. So I needed to remind myself of that. Um, that how presence translates in that way to the presence of what is absent, um, the presence of, of, um, of what's in one's imagination. And in that sense might be absent out there, but because through the performance, it becomes present. And then even the idea of time, you know, the presence of this moment, um, that it's um, when one starts thinking about this interplay of multiple things, then you draw on the past and you shaping in this this moment. Now you are you are you are informing, reimagining something for the future. So that kind of I needed to convince myself of that, remind myself of that once again um, um, to. Yeah, to 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 feel, and I, I don't want to say justified, validated, but that it makes sense that I am here too, um, you know, and 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 even and as I am here, I'm not here just by myself. Um, it's not just me, um, and I think that really, this is the this is an, another moment that we are, you know, in the in South Africa. It seems like we always have these moments. Maybe globally, we're always yeah. having these. Where we need to remind ourselves of 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 why we do why what we do um, in a very particular way um, as well. And um, as you said, the, when I said I was prancing around as a praying mantis, quite literally, um, is even that you know the praying mantis is this is is one of the big motivations of 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 this latest um, uh, work my most recent work is about showing the power of the invisible the strength of the being vulnerable the um you know just just how much can be said with what we choose to to not see um what is present with what we choose to not see etc all of those um all of those things um and also how you know the the desire that we have to 
um, you know, so for me, the praying mantis is all about desire and compassion. And I try, I work with those kinds of, of uh, um, I'm thinking about those qualities when I'm working through the, the, the praying mantis. And so just that, this desire that we want for change, this desire we want for transformation, to be better, to be different, to reimagine. And at the same time, in order for that to happen, we need to allow things to happen. There needs to be the sense of allowing things to be, which compassion can only do. That it's not necessarily within your own power to do that. It's about, it's about making space for everything so that things can unfold in a particular way. That, that's, that's compassion. And so for me, I feel like I, um, that through the practice, um, if I remind myself of those uh, fundamental principles, then I am, I am very much engaged with, um, with how the world is, is at the moment. Yeah, it feels very mm. real and, and, and relevant. Mm. Mm, thanks, Jackie. Um, I, I I love that you you uh, pardon me. Sorry, my my dog is rather excited about something going on outside. I apologize for background noise. Um, I like that you've you've kind of taken us to presence because that's one of the things that you know um it stands front and center of this conversation. Um, because in in many ways, I think you know we we've, we've kicked this idea about uh, in a couple of conversations that we've had here is is, is what the dental moment um, offers or perhaps prevents us from doing, and it all seems to circulate around this question of what is does it mean to be present, right, in the digital moment in the digital age. Um, it also strikes me that 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 this question of presence isn't something that's necessarily unique to dance practice in the theatre. That, that all forms of performance in some way or the other kind of engage with this question of being present, of being present with others, um, of sharing space collectively. This is kind of utopian gesture, right? In sitting together collectively um, with performance. But I'm, I, I'm wondering what it is about dance specifically or, or kind of body-based practices that don't begin from the text primarily. Um, or, or how they, they kind of produce a sense of presence that might be different or or might complicate our understanding of what presence is um, in these kind of various uh, performance contexts. And I mean, to go back to haunting because that's something else that I was, I was picking up there. Um, but I'm wondering whether the, the obviousness of the body, the centrality of the body in dance and these other kind of ways of working um, is, is conferring something onto our sensibility of what presence means. That is quite particular to us. That is quite particular to working in the body. That's different to perhaps a more conventional, kind of traditional theatrical paradigm. Um, put differently, how do how do dance and presence articulate together, and specifically in a way that's perhaps different to the theatrical kind of framing they are. Mm, that's so question. <laughs> You know, I mean, on one hand, I'm, I, I think, and this is just a conversation, right? So I'm not going to be like hell to these things. And, but on the, my first thought that comes to mind is that the idea of presence, like with, because it's a, because dance is so concerned with the body and, 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 and the line of the body and the form and the musculature and, and how high we can jump and how perfectly we can balance and showing off the body, showing off the form of the body, not just the voice, um, which, you know, I mean, I'm, now I'm being reductive. Um, yeah, but like, whereas maybe people in theater would be about the voice and how they can play with the different resonators, et cetera, et cetera. But the dance is like this whole body. And so there's a, there's a, 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 big, right? there's a big ego that goes there. There's a really big ego with presence, with, with, with showing how and showing, you know, and it's, and it's the back and the side and under the arm and under your feet. And it's like, you know, the, how you hold your head and the neck and it's all of, all of this external that is so important, so, so important for dance. Um, and it's something that I've really pushed against. Um, and I say that 
but of course I work the body. Of course I exercise and I, and I work on the musculature and I'm working on all of these things with my body all the time because at the same time, I understand that this is the, the conduit that I'm needing to work through all my philosophies. Whatever that might be, it's still a conduit. It's the way I navigate in the world, et cetera. You know, it's the car that needs the regular service, et cetera. So I need to, I need to, I need to look after this body and there's a particular, you know, I need to eat healthy. I need to do all of those things so that I can present myself in the world um, and and so I think that one of the things and and so as important as that is I think that often with dance we get trapped we just stop there that the presence of the body just kind of we, we, we get stuck with with just this line form etc all of these things that we've been trained um, you know that we've been taught to is important but actually there's you know I've, you, when, you, when you talk about, I think when one looks at performers that where there was like a real, you say, oh, they had such a connection on stage. When we, mm -hmm. when we as audiences observe con connection, it seldom goes to because he lifted her so high or because she jumped so high or because she could do the split so wonderfully. It's, it's, it's never that. It's something else that's, that's, that's going on that we perceive as, as an audience. And when you're dancing, it's the same thing. You get a connection because of something else. There is this, this, this other kind of vibration that happens between bodies. Um, and, and it's tapping into that vibration that is a lot more difficult um, because that vibration literally <laughs> makes one shake, literally like puts you, puts, puts you on edge. So, so yeah, there's, I think I'm going off your question is I started off saying that the, you know, that I think that we get stuck with ego, the dancers kind of sense of presence is, is, is stuck in that. I think um, most of the time. Um, mm. And, and which is also another reason why you you seldom find there are very few dancers who are old. And like after 36, 40 years old, it's the old dancer. You know, it's it's it becomes this older body. It's like, and all of a sudden it's a it's like a completely different category. We mm -hmm. we stop, we 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 um even when we're looking at presence of the dancer's body, we're putting it in the in an age box as well. Um, there's a certain there's a certain kind of skin skin texture that we are requiring. You know, there's a certain kind of elasticity that we require of this. So it's a little bit uh, messed up, I think. Um, and 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 I, you know, I've really like like try to to push against that. That there's a whole lot more to presence. That that what you think you're seeing is not the only thing. It's like it's almost like scales have to go off our eyes so that we can mm. see something else. And I think that if we can push into that more as performers, that's really exciting because then people end up imagining other things about themselves other things about their own presence. They forget where they're sitting. They forget that they're in the theater, if it's the theater or if it's in a field, they forget where they are. They get transported themselves because something else has happened in that present moment because of the presence of the performance, the pre presence of the performer, the, the energy that's being conveyed, et cetera. Mm. Um, no, I hear and, you. And it's I, an ongoing I, work, it's exciting. Yeah, I love that you use the word connection because I think that 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 helps me um, make sense of what I was reaching for, that sense of something uh, tangible or uh, something intangible, but, but nevertheless palpable, right, around how we feel when watching these things happen. And I think maybe maybe this, this, this relationship is about the relationship between presence and, and how it signals a kind of connection that exceeds just being physically present in the space. Um, and I see the circles made a point here about um, witnessing being witnesses and being witness and performance as a way of inviting that. And I 100% agree. I wonder if that sense of connection is founded in recognizing that these people, these bodies on stage, whether that's a kind of conventional stage or site specific, whatever the case may be, aren't just present in the space, but they are manifesting a kind of energistic presence um, that comes from being in the space together and recognizing the sharing of space collectively, both with co-performers, but also with the people in the audience, right, the spectator. So maybe it really is about co-presence, right, is, is, is that all presence is haunted by the things that are not present, 
or the things that are not manifest or not tangible. Um, and that, yeah, that, that sense of connection arises from, from being able to kind of lean into the sharing of space with others as the foundation of the thing, rather than that egoistic, I'm here and it's just me. Um, and so I'm also wondering the degree then to which we can think about a, a, a kind of an additional step in that presencing, right? And how things like contact and touch, especially now when we're distanced by all of this, right? Is around what, what being open to touch and being touched might mean then in the context of, of a moment when we are increasingly being distanced, when we are legally in some ways being prevented from being able to make physical contact with other people. Um, and what that means then in terms of connection and in terms of, of recognizing our presence as found in, in both a material contact with others, um, as well as this kind of philosophical or imaginative sharing of space with each other. Can I? I'm just, mm, 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 by all means. Now, I just wanted to, before going on to the contact in touch, uh, but it does link, um, you know, you're using the words, um, the presence of things and the presence of others um, when, and, and I really, I think it's important to lean into things and lean into others. Um, and that, that then when one leans into, into the, the kind of the, the sense behind the, those words, then it goes beyond just the people in the room that the witnessing is not just about people that are witnessing. Um, because as soon as one kinds of, um, as soon as you start, or for, for me at least, I mean, over time, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the um, centralizing being human, the importance of being human and, and only human, and that we are above and over everything else around us has become less and less important. <laughs> Um, and so when it's about, when, when one is in communion with not just the performer that you're with, as in the other human that you're with, or the people, the audience, but also it's the, it's the energies in the space, it's, the, it's the, the, the dust mites, it's the, and I know I might sound ridiculous here, but it's this, it's, it's like, there's, there's, there's so many elements that are witnessing, also from times gone by. You know, um, like from before, before you entered the space, there was something, there are other things, there were other people in the space, other, other worlds existed there. And so, and so there's this, there's this, um, all of that comes into play. Um, and so the witnessing is vast, you know, um, and then if one has that kind of sensibility, then you're not playing forward. You're not only playing for the audience that's there in front of you or around you or what you're not just playing in that way you're playing underneath and inside and you're playing and and all of a sudden everything becomes a lot more generous um and there's a there's a and then you begin to touch i think so and then there's then and so and so then contact this idea of contact and the, this this kind of obsession that we have that we need to touch with our hands also is not that important. Why does touch need to be with my hand? Um, and so for me um, with incorporating, um, so I say I incorporate Bhutto principles, right? And so, so the ways of seeing is, a, is, 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 um, is quite an, um, is one of the principles of Bhutto where you've got like eyes all over the body. So, you know, um, there's, there's, there's not just these eyes that can see, but I've also developed these other, this, this other sensibility of the body where, um, you know, if one were to imagine, for example, that the face was inverted onto the abdomen. So these, my breasts would be my eyes, my navel would be my nose, my mouth would be the pelvic area and vice versa. There's a whole other way I'd be looking at someone, touching someone. Um, there's a there's a whole other way that I'd be leaning on them, etc. And I find that really exciting. Um, and but what's interesting with this question is that you know last year, there were with with COVID, we had all of these um, convers. Everybody was all in a state, of course, right? We still are. <laughs> we still trying to deal with how do we get to move together in the room? How can we do we get past the self screen thing and 
What do we do when we're in contact? Because, because contact, touch, touch, touch is so important. And, and uh, I joined in many of these conversations because for a long time I was, you know, I was, um, I've been teaching and, and really trying to think of the body and working and reimagining the body so that we, we touch each other differently, that we connect differently with each other. Um, and not just in these conventional westernized aesthetics, you know, um, where the feet are at the bottom and the heads at the top. Um, and what was interesting is in dance environments, and I don't know if there are many dance people, I would, people would listen and nod their heads and then continue to talk about the 1.5 meter box and, and um, the importance of making sure that the bodies are staying apart. And it would, we wouldn't talk about how do we, how can, what would happen if I were to touch with the back of my head and, 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 and what would happen if I, if I were to imagine that the body was elastic lines? So if it's an elastic line and I touch, it's gonna move away from me and not towards me. And that's another way of perceiving contact, that it's moving away from you all the time instead of pushing against and doing all these rolls and over and under, and that's all wonderful, but it's not the only way to make contact. Um, and I found that quite interesting. So and I don't know if that's going to happen now too. I, I, I sound like a mad person talking and people go, mm, lovely. And then we ask the next question because that's certainly what I found whenever I was in, in, in dance environments and I'd start talking about, um, you know, just let's just reimagine the contact work. Um, mm. it, it would get shut down with, measurements of boxes and how many people can get into the space. And, and that would become the obsession. Um, so the administration of it would become a lot more um, engaging, it seems, for people than the actual work of trying mm -hmm. to, to reimagine um, ourselves alongside someone else. Yeah, look, I don't think that that's crazy at all. Um... And, and, you know, there, there are two kinds of little themes that I want to pick up here that you, you've touched on again um, in relation to touch and contact and, and its capacity to move us. And, and I, <laughs> that, that pun is quite deliberate because I want to kind of grip that word in all its expansive kind of possible directions, moving literally, but also moving affectively. And um, it's, it's, it's this question of centrousness um, and how perhaps working through the body, I'm hearing you suggest, attunes us to firstly is feeling and sensing the world more thoughtfully through the flesh, um, is recognizing how the world is always sensuously embodied. So even when you're not necessarily thinking through or grounded in an awareness of how the body is registering things, that there's always this kind of traits, these, these, these ways that that the body haunts everything we do and everything we do is haunted by the body, right? So it's sensuousness in those two registers is that we always collapse back into material flesh, into a body and context and space and time. Um, but that also we're attuning ourselves to, to, to engaging with the world through the matter of the body first, rather than perhaps, you know, psychically or whatever, the, the other ways yeah. that we're kind of preconditioned for, for entering into. So to the extent that I'm trying to imagine and seize onto something that dance helps us to do, that working through the body helps us to do, that's where it seems to be for me, is that first we've, we've spoken about this idea of perhaps shifting notions of presence or imagining other ways of, of presencing, as Jayhan suggests there, um, but also is this, this attunement to the sensuousness of the world that we live in. Um, and the kind of inviolable links between the kind of material, uh, the kind of fleshy body um, and the kinds of concepts and ideas that, 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 that shape how we, we, we engage with those. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to kind of also catch the conversations on the side here in the chat. Um, Jan is saying, I feel like from a previous talk, uh, it was also about how we can deliver tools of creativity across this medium. Um, also applies the idea we can, that we can deliver experiences that build intimacy, that share suffering, that allow for catharsis, um, and aren't all these dynamics of being present. But now it's a new kind of presencing. Jehan, what do you mean by a new kind of presencing? Are you kind of reaching for what else as well as, as perhaps it's a shift in 
No, I think or you, an some way of understanding. You already mentioned, like, as I was suggesting, was exactly you already folded it into what you were saying. So I'm just listening in right now. Um, I just, I'm just trying to think about the 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 counterpoint to this is this yearning to go back to space, yearning to touch, yearning to go back to learning the way that we did in physical presence. Um, is I'm a little confused because we look at it. Here's where I am. We look at it as a. Sometimes we're celebrating what is now possible and the fact that you can actually create a lot of experiences uh, in mediated environments across great distances now because the digital allows for that. And now it's just for us to explore and experiment on all the ways that we can have, have deliver and commune in different ways through the experience. Um, but at the same time, I know that we are all people who trained in somatic, we train somatically, right? We train in space and we're trying to see how we can now explore this space with that prior knowledge. And so I am concerned about if I was to go rara, we can really do a lot more for a lot more people across this medium and still bring a lot of this stuff in, but they don't have the original experience and I still I don't still have an answer to that. And that's been a question that's been posed from day one. What happens, like it, it came in like, for example, when how do we induct people into the experience of theater if the first experience of theater is going to be digital? Um, and yeah, so that old, that old chestnut, uh, he's, it's still there. I haven't, I don't have a way to, to get away from that. I'm not, I'm not even sure if I'm looking for a way to get away from that. But I am trying to, I mean, one of the reasons listening to you, Jackie, is really interesting is because I just feel like dancers, um, dancers and people who are working from dance, uh, they seem to have adapted to everything much faster over here. They seem to be, they, they, they stepped into the space much with much more alacrity than we did in the theater world, not to put a fake sort of dichotomy between the two. I think it's all part of a continuum. But I'm just I'm sorry. It's a it's a it's a chain of thought, Nyeni. It's not a it's not a. I'm still the jury's still out with me on on this. It's it's also me thinking about your idea and your quest of radical intimacy. Like how do we how do we continue to construct this? And uh, just to give you a and this is the last thing I'm going to say and shut up and somebody else please take take over. But <laughs> it's this idea of of um um. I've been watching Elon Musk and everyone trying to like get to Mars and you know oh. hyper drive <laughs> and all of this going to space and I love it I, I love it for multiple reasons right but then I suddenly thought to myself that this is a physical corporeal manifestation of us and of consciousness right this is not just intellect or experience it's consciousness and I'm just saying that if we're pursuing, if we start going down the, 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 if we start questing in the sense of radical intimacy, if we start questing in the sense of how we can bridge something where I can have a conversation with you, Mgeni, and we can, we can feel for each other, even though we're in totally different spaces now, um, and we start building those out, then who's to say we ever needed to physically move our bodies from any one, and Jackie, this is where you, yeah, who's to say we need to ever physically transport our why was the journey physical? Why can't it just be a journey of consciousness? And then, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, think about somebody who's got total disabilities of multiple kinds, they're either hearing impaired or sensory impaired or something like that. And we want to give them, or we want to give them, or they should, they should be able to, ex they experience, sorry, not they should be able to, they do experience their own consciousness and their own, have their own experiences of the world, which are equally real. So now that I've sort of exploded all of that, I just feel like I don't have to map anything to physical, but don't I, have to, I don't have to map it to intellectual. I, I don't know. This is where I'm at, and it's a very swimmy kind of space. Sorry. Mm. No, thank you, Jehan. Um, Kamidi, I see your hand. If you give me just one second. Um, Jehan, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a really, really rich kind of um, set of proposals as well, because one of the things that, and I know Jackie you, you know, um, mentioned this in passing the other day, is this question of, the assumption that we come to the digital space with is that we're we're assuming that we're engaging with this moment from an equal footing. 
um, in terms of the bodies that are arriving within the digital space. Whereas in fact, um, you know, people with different, differently abled bodies have always had to navigate the world that we've suddenly come to confront um, in ways that, that are not conventional, right? Um, we're thinking about questions of access and all these other things. Are, are, we're, we're brand fresh with the birds on, on that discussion. But people whose bodies don't kind of meet the standard of the you know, typical body for whom the world is designed have always already been engaged with these questions. Um, you know, so again, radical intim intimacy, but also thinking towards this kind of planetary outlook. I think that that's one of these opportunities is that we're being forced to reckon with the world in a way that we perhaps had not been compelled to in the past. And in doing so is to recognize that these limitations are unique to this moment now, perhaps, but that there are other people for whom the world is always limited in those ways. Um, there was an interesting documentary that, that, that uh, it was just kind of one of these short, I think, Vox documentaries or something, you know, those, those, those Facebook shares, um, where a lot of uh, kind of neuro, neuro, non-neurotypically, I forget what the term is, um, kind of persons are, 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 are talking about the terror that they feel about this return to normal, because for the, for the immediate kind of, you know, period of lockdown, the, the, the ways that we've been forced to engage with one another um, has actually opened up doors for a lot of people who otherwise would not be able to inhabit the world in a particular way. Um, so absolutely, I think that there's, 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 there's a lot to be said for thinking from the opposite side of this conversation. We tend to lament what we've lost because of how we are compelled to work now. Um, but there is also a lot that people who don't live in the world the way we do have gained from, from this moment. Camille. Yeah, I don't want to talk too long because that was real, already something really rich that Jihan left us. But I, I, it's all just really interesting talking about just even now, just as we're kind of transferring into talking about ability and disability in some ways too, just because I guess uh, some of the poorer kind of arts like basketball here in this country was always really powerful to me because they were a lot of young, uh, poor black guys, uh, Michael Jordan, Charles Barkley came from deep South, very kind of very intense racial situations. And it always was meaningful to me. I remember Charles Barkley talking about, I was always listening because I was trying to find out what he did. It wasn't just that he's a talented, larger than life personality, but I was trying to figure out what he was doing. And he said he knew because he was a shorter guy and he, he ends up being very popular because he was, he was good at being able to get rebounds, which is a big man sport. And he was only six, five, most good rebounders or 6'10 or whatever. Sorry, I'm getting into the woods with this. But he said he would jump over a fence that was about, I think he said about four to five feet. And he just kept doing that for hours at a time because he knew this, the, the key to rebounding, even if he was going to be a shorter player, was to just keep, it was in his legs, not in his arms. His strength wasn't about being strong. And the guy asked him, he said, you did that specifically to try to get better at being able to jump and second jump? He said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was so precious for me to hear that. Because, you know, this is guy is considered a world-class talent. I always had this impression that some athletes were, because they were so creative on the court, they were rehearsing things that might not happen on the court with anybody on the court as if they were happening right there. And they had to put all the energy as if something was happening in front of them that wasn't in front of them. And it made me think, because I, I remember Akeem Olajuwon talking about Michael Jordan and saying there's a creative quality. And I, I just never thought about basketball as being a creative thing, but obviously it is. And it just made me think about ability and disability and somebody being short at five foot ten or, or somebody being seven foot tall. Anyway, this got me on to all these th thinkings about the way in which someone expresses their body and whatever you got, you use. And you find ways to be even super powered and with whatever thing you 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 have to overcompensate with anyway let me shut up i'm talking too much <laughs> but anyway not, not, at all. not at all jackie i see your hand um this this, this <laughs> perhaps to put too fine a point on it but but the body is one of the things that is most easily within reach or we assume it to be right and that you assume that it's the same kind of body that is within easy reach for all of us so it becomes easy i think to romanticize dance these practices in the body as an open you know kind of uh, democratic kind of space from which we all uh, work from an equal footing, but that's not necessarily the case. 
um, those things are, are not as easy within reach for some of us. Yeah, Kennedy? Mm -hmm. Oh, and that was the thing I wanted to mention too. These two were both the tallest people in their entire families for generations. And it made me think about what they were able to do with their families in terms of taking them out of poverty and transforming them their lives in some ways just by playing mm -hmm. this basketball. It made me think about the power of the imagination to push forward an image of yourself that is, doesn't even exist in reality but gets pulled and stretched. So you're six foot five and six foot six to the length to which you've never, nobody in your family's ever been. Your arms mm -hmm. and hands are bigger than anything. So anyway, it just made me think about just the magic that Jackie's talking about uh, translating into reality for some of these guys who were maybe in some of the poorer uh, situations in their lives in terms of black people. Mm -hmm. so, anyway. mm -hmm. Jackie? Yeah, I and mean, I appreciate you saying that. I was because when you were talking about him jumping over this fence over and over, I was I was I was thinking about the importance of iteration, you know, mm. and and um, it's like fake it until you make it. It's you you have to you have to believe it. You have to really imagine it, and you keep on reinforcing that imagination. You keep on doing it over and over and over, and eventually it manifests. It manifests in, in, in the way you are, I mean, to use the word that was used before, the way you are being witnessed, but also the way you witness yourself, the way you, you, ex, um, you, know, you experience um, the world. But Jayan, you were talking about what, when, when he was, um, um, you were saying, um, when you were talking about how does one get like, you know, people into this, the, the, these things, these questions that you were, that you were streaming with. How do you teach people for the first time, et cetera, and all of that. And I was thinking that it's not so much about, you know, um, I think there's something about the quality of what we're doing and not so much like it's, it's there's, a, there's a certain kind of quality that goes into, into, into the consciousness. And, and I think, you know, you, you were saying, so because I don't think that, the, that, what, that it was easier for dancers than it's for theater people. I think both across the board, we are, we are struggling with the same kinds of questions. But for me, um, um, you were, when you were talking about consciousness, I was just, um, I started thinking, I was just thinking about this idea of, of consciousness. So Agamben speaks about um, consciousness and experience. And this idea of this idea of that what we what we experience prior to speaking, prior to articulating that experience, is consciousness, right? So prior to putting it in words, in a language, and in terms of our performance, I mean, I could speak reductively and say that the discipline of the dance or the way we're going to speak the words, etc., that would be a kind of uh, um, uh, the performance of, of everything that we'd rehearsed, right? It's like of the experience of before, the experience of the process then gets shown in that, in the way we articulate it. But that experience before we articulate it is consciousness. And that gets shown through gestures or through sound, through things, through, through, um, um, through, through actions that have got no like kind of particular form yet, that doesn't have a particular form yet. And that is a magical moment. That I think is what, so leaning more into that kind of consciousness and only the body can, you know, so that's, that is done through the body. So yeah. you were saying, so does this whole experience now mean that we just can sit and never have to leave our spaces because this digital space is so powerful? I don't agree because we experience things. We arrive at consciousness through the body before we begin to articulate it in a particular form, in a particular kind of style. It's our experience that happens with, 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 through our senses, et cetera. And then when it comes to radical intimacy, so you were talking about bodies that are struggling and you know, bodies, who are, what happens if you don't have sound, if you can't hear or you can't see. So I have this one very good friend who um, is really sensuous, really sensuous. And she, she had a gorgeous, gorgeous woman and, and had a, a, a very kind of active life in all kinds of ways prior to a terrible accident that happened when she was 20, 21 years old, which rendered her paraplegic. And, and she still, 20 years later, very, very sensuous and still having active, radical, intimate love lives, right? And, and so I think that word radical intimacy is, is also about how we perceive intimacy. So for her, 
for example, and this is, and I think that this is that looking at bodies that 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 are not as capable, right? Um, that are capable differently. I asked her once. I said, "How is it that you continue to to have all these lovers, and you know, you how how is it that you're remaining intimate?" Like, and she said it was about memory. So she remembered, and she she remembered certain sensations. And even though, so she talks about the moment when she discovered that she was paraplegic and the doctor comes and he does the needle test, right? And you can't feel anything. He pushes and he pushes and she pushes. And basically he says like, you can't feel anything. And yet she could convince herself through a consciousness because of an experience that she'd had in the past and really, really reiterating that imagination all the time, all the time, pulling that into, into herself she could then begin to feel even at places where the doctor said she couldn't feel even where she was told she wasn't able to feel she was she's able to feel because of her imagination because of drawing at, at her consciousness in such a deliberate way and i think that that's maybe there's something there for us you know um mm. when yeah, when we when we're looking at these these bodies that are that can't walk and can't stand and can't roll and kick and jump and and do all of these 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 active things that there's another kind of an activity that they engage in that we can learn from even in this digital moment that mm. it's about maybe it's about us also remembering what it is about performance that um that needs to now be conveyed differently mm. and that 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 um, you know it 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 doesn't completely deny the one. It doesn't say that this is the only way. It's actually calling on different things, gathering them together, and then in that gathering, something else is created. Um, and I think that's for me. That's what radical intimacy is about. That it's not just it's now now we're so radical because we can fall in love through the screen. But there's, there's, there's a, you know, there's something, there's something that we have to do with the way we think, and that thinking is very much connected to what we do, and so we can't, we can't be talking about um, because we're thinking all of these things. It means we never have to move. The, the, the movement is going to, is going to provoke the thinking. The thinking is going to provoke. It's all kind of working together. I mean, yeah, um, yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's that's kind of what what's where we're what I'm thinking. In terms yeah, a hundred percent. Those those two things kind of constitute one another, right? Is, is is sensing and being in the body constitutes how we think, and how we think informs how we sense being in the body. I think that's really and how we remember. How we remember, mm. and then when we remember, we remember. We push. You know, we remember again. We put the things back together again back differently. Together. Something yeah. else is going to happen, mm. um, and I think. I think that's really exciting um, and, and very scary, as it must be for somebody who all of a sudden gets told you can't walk any longer. It's devastating. Mm. Mm. But then you go, all right, and now what? What do I do? And are we in a similar kind of moment? And it's, it's interesting, you know, because it's, I think we have the, we have the um, examples out there. We've got people who've done mm. that. We're just not drawing on them. So in terms of dance, for example, we need to be looking at how people with disabilities perform intimately. How do they touch? And they touch awkwardly. They touch differently. They touch with difficulty. They touch with, you know, there's a whole other, other way of moving. And there's something exciting there for us as as performers. Mm. I think that uh, we can learn from these from from these other bodies, as opposed to just holding the grand form and the upright body so boldly mm -hmm. uh, in front of us, you know, as if it's God. Um, I think there are many gods. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amy, I think your observation there in the chat is is, is super super generative. I wonder if you would mind speaking to it. Um, I'm worried about butchering its its beautiful sense by reading it out, so I'm, I'm handing it over to you. But I, I really love this this challenge, kind of physicality and and distance, right? That you you're taking up there, and I wonder if you could speak to that a little more. Yeah, I was really um, interested. You know, but it was wonderful what you mentioned about the buto uh, eyes all over and this kinesthetic perception that uh, that you have as a dancer. 
Um, and so much of what I think I contend with is just the what you I guess you could call the scopic regime. You know, it's the it's the domination of the visual. Mm. And, and mm. how would we think about anything if we weren't dominated by our eyes? I mean, what would yeah. this experience be like if we weren't you know, kind of like glued to this little screen with its little compartments. It's it's so, um, and the way we conceive of performance, I wonder if we if we can think of form being smell or form being, you know, touch. It's like, it's so visually encoded for, for, for me, the idea of form. And, um, and, and that seems to be so much of, well, and then, and then as, I was, as I was listening to you speak, I was, uh, and the, about intimacy, I was, think, I was thinking, um, you know, for me, intimacy would be defined also by what, where the shame boundary is. Where do I start to feel ashamed? Then, then I start to feel, okay, that's intimate now because I'm, I'm on some kind of boundary of what might feel a little bit shaming or, and um, in Gestalt, there's a really interesting, uh, Gestalt psychology is a really interesting idea of shame being that which, um, you know, just people aren't ready for. They just, they're not able to deal with it. They just, um, they're not, they're not able to meet it. It's, it's a space of contact that they can't, they can't make contact. But shame is so visual. Like, I mean, who's ashamed of anything when they've got their eyes shut? Like it's, it's, you know, it's so, again, it's such a visually encoded thing. This when, you know, it, I, anyway, I, I think I'm just babbling, you know, there seems to be, a, uh, <laughs> Uh, but but you know because there's so many ideas that get sparked. But but um, but that's somehow where I'm. This what? How do we measure distance? How do we measure intimacy? What if we didn't encode it visually so much? I guess mm -hmm. what if it weren't mm -hmm. just a place? Mm -hmm. Or or if not visually in a kind of literal spatialization of distance, right? Um, and what you what you're suggesting um, in the sense, right? I think you specifically said that you know somehow you're closer to me than my physical neighbors even though we are literally thousands of kilometers apart is i, I don't really i think it's, it's it's what we kind of might think of in terms of translocality is our capacity to be connected to multiple disparate places that aren't connected by a straight line necessarily but that collapse into or over one another um through whatever you know means connect us in that way um me and you here cape town you're in hobart we are in the same place, though physically incredibly distance from one another. And again, I think that, that that takes us back to where the conversation kind of began with this question of presence and presencing, but also witnessing and, and, and recognizing that shared space, perhaps the provocation here is to recognize that it needn't be physical. And that's deeply challenging to me. And, and, and I'm alive to the question that Jehan is asking about this kind of dystopian future, right? We have the privilege, for want of a better word, of having understood what it is to convene physically and knowing what the absence of that physical kind of register of convening of meeting of presence might mean what do we do then how do we think about those things when you know people are arriving at this thing we do called performance dance whatever it might be without having had that prior experience through which to imagine and I guess vivify their sense of their own presence in, in the performing making, performance making kind of moment. If, um, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm just, so, so um, I, I really also like, appreciate what you said there, Amy. Um, and you're right, this, this idea of, you know, having been, the, the, this idea of having eyes all over the body is one thing, but also the way we use these eyes. So once you, if you imagine that you've got eyes on your, behind your head and under, on your hands and everywhere, then we still have these eyes, right? And, and what the idea of looking, instead of seeing what's directly in front of you, so one of the principles of Bhutto is to look peripherally. So you use your eyes to see what's on the side of you. So you kind of forced to not like look at anything directly, right? And that kind of changes one's perception quite a lot. But what's interesting, and I, I started doing, um, this was interesting, an interesting exercise to do online because I, I now frightened every time I have to teach anything that's, that's like this online and you can't, you can't actually hear people's breath um, and, and, and really feel how they are in the room. But one of the things that, I, that um, I extend the eyes to is saying that the room that you're in also has eyes. And so once you've gone, once you've gone beyond like just you looking at the space and you're looking at the world with all these 
eyes and, and wow, everything is so big. Then you allow yourself to be looked at and you allow the space that you're in to look at you. And, and now if you're, if you're in your room, um, but most people are in their, in their very, in very comfortable spaces, right? They're in their bedroom, they're on their couch. It's a space that's familiar. It's a space they take for granted. Now, all of a sudden, you have to allow yourself to be looked at in the space that you're in. And I can tell you, like 99, uh, there's been people have broken down online just and I'm having to do a whole other exercise to bring them back and say, remember where you are, you're in your room. And just like, because there's this, all of a sudden you become aware of the power of the, of, of, of presence that's always there. You know, that's, 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 and yeah, I, I've, I don't know if you, if you know what, I, what I'm trying to say. So this, 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 um, I mean, be going back to, to, to presence again, but the ways of looking, Ways of looking is not only from me outwards, it's also from the outside in. So, so um, um, and that's, you know, and then that changes proximity completely um, in, in, to, in how we smell, in how we taste, in, 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 in a number, of, a, a number of, of ways. It changes that proximity to things. You, you might feel very distant from the space that you thought you were so intimately familiar with. Or you might all of a sudden realize that you, you know, it might be the, it might have the opposite effect. And I think that that kind of um, shaking up of the body and shaking up of ourselves and our certitudes that we have of who we are and where we are and how we are, it, it's the beginning of something. I don't know what, but I think it's something mm -hmm. happens in that moment that we need to, that we need to just look into and, and, and not be frightened of. Um, and, and what's interesting, what happens as soon as, what, what I found, as soon as people start becoming aware of the awareness of everything, they become softer, a lot more sensitive, a lot more careful, and not so bold and, and knowing what we, what, you know, where to go. All of a sudden there's a sensitivity, even, in, even on their couch, you know, they, 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 feel, they feel their buttocks differently. Um, and it's, <laughs> And I think, I think that's really important for us, just, just as practitioners who've maybe very established in what we're doing and, and feeling like we know, and now you don't know any longer. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. there's something in, in like just, just looking at things differently and, 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 and going with that. Um, yeah. Yeah, Jackie. Um, thank you. And, and you know, I've, again, <laughs> I keep going back to the concept. I think our impulse is to want to experience and frame and name this moment as one of disorientation. But I wonder if it's more productive to think about it as not even a reorientation, but a kind of unorienting moment, right? Where we we are being compelled to recognize that we have been oriented in a particular way and to find ways of disentangling us from our fixity within those oriented structures in order to recognize the possibility for other ways of becoming oriented differently, right? So it's, it's not the disorientation, but a kind of a, a process of unorienting oneself in order right. to become oriented in other ways. I think it's a really exciting provocation. You didn't lose um, anything, you lost, hmm. losing. Hmm. It's gathering, mm. gathering, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's mm. becoming a lot bigger. Um, I think bigger than we could have imagined, like um, what uh, Camille was speaking about, <laughs> that, you know, the, the, the proportions change, mm. proportions will change. Mm. Lesejo, I missed your hand earlier on my dear. I see that it's been up for a minute. No worries at all. Um, I, I was gonna, I, I was gonna basically say something similar to what you've just said, um, because I find it very generative. Well, I've been trying to make sense of things through translation theory, um, and I find it very generative. This idea, um, even drawing from what Jehan was saying about uh, how are we teaching a thing that we already know is one thing. Uh, I think it's all just translation. If I move to France, I speak English they speak French. So it starts with me saying, oh, wait, uh, where, I'm, where I'm from, we say hello. Oh, you say bonjour, okay, cool. And then it becomes, oh, now I know how to say, comment ça va? Um, and then they know how to say, I'm fine, how are you, right? But it's that in 
this sharing of, oh, I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to tell you how we do it. And the sharing of, oh, I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to tell you how we do it. It's not so much that you absorb what is mine and I absorb what is yours, but that in the sharing, something new is emerging. And that something new is a new language. Um, I always think of language as, um, as just disciplining instinct, as systems that discipline instinct. Dance is a disciplining of instinct. I take a step because I'm walking, because that is my instinct. But then I am taught to point my toe when I take the step. And that is a particular kind of disciplining of instinct, right? And we have these instincts. We have the instinct to communicate. We have the instinct to share space together. The instincts are there and we're just, I think, finding a new system of disciplining it or disrupting the discipline that already exists. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Uh, and and the question of, I really like this idea of language and I'm going to add language and perhaps form, right, more broadly conceived um, as a way of disciplining instincts or, or what would otherwise bubble up and govern or uncontrolled. Um, I think it's a really interesting provocation. We have about six minutes left in the official portion of the conversation, which as we know, ends at a quarter past the hour or a quarter to in India with its weird time zones with half hour increments. Um, and then we'll go into our kind of water cooler chat thereafter. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess by, by way of beginning to close off, um, I want to take up Amy's provocation to think about intimacy as a shame boundary. <laughs> Um, and the kind of radical intimacy being our capacity to kind of push through what we might experience as shame as being disoriented, all of these other things. I think they're, they're all connected, right? It's about recognizing that precarity, being off-center, being off-center, off to kind of use the dance thing um, for a second, isn't necessarily a toxic or dangerous or, or unsafe or, you know, situation to be in, um, but that it, if we embrace and recognize where we're coming from in those moments where we're confronted with our boundary to shame, something incredibly generative can happen um, if we open ourselves up to it and recognize that the stakes perhaps are lower than we think they might be, that that boundary is an imagined one. And all we need to do is, 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 is orient ourselves differently, is open ourselves to other ways of being oriented towards these questions of shame. Um, I wanted to, yeah, I, 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 I'm just trying to kind of pick up on any last bits of things that I might have missed in the chat. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, so Jehan is asking again, but then how do I go back to go, I have to go back to school. How am I running a drama school through this time of the digital? And, and I think Jackie- Carefully, carefully. Sorry? Sensitively. Sensitively and carefully, carefully, says Jackie. Carefully. Yeah, I think, yeah, committee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to some of what Jihan's concerns are because it sounds like it's oh, it's connected with what Jackie was saying too. You know, I'm 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 I've been diagnosed as uh, I guess they call it socially anxious. So I'm I'm you know it's it's a difficult thing for me to be around a lot of people, right? I'm good with three or four people, but larger than that, and it's just a huge amount of input, right? So uh, you know, when I gravitated from writing to theater it was always a thing that energized me, right? I was very nervous in front of people and on a certain level, I was kind of used to ha having to deal with that all my life. So it was an engagement with a lot of input all the time. So when Jackie starts talking about those exercises where you have to imagine your room is having a bunch of eyes around you and everything, I, I can really relate to those things because they really feel real to me um, because I'm used to having feeling like that, right? Maybe, uh, and so I just say that in some way to just talk about sensitivities and, and what those sensitivities mean in relationship to them moving through our bodies in some ways, right? Um, so there, there's some exercises she talked about I can really relate to, you know? Um, and I wonder if that speaks to what we do as human beings to compensate, right? Like. Uh, what are our prosthetics that we use that we don't even know our prosthetics for us um, that allow us to do amazing things out in the world or amazing things on stage or whatever, right? Because I know I need prosthetics and I couldn't even tell you what I've been doing in order to compensate for the, the shyness. So <laughs> anyway, I just say all that. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. 
interesting. I like this idea of prosthetics as well. Um, that we kind of may or may, oh, my dog has the worst timing, um, that we may or may not realize that we're using. I don't know. Um, I'm also trying to kind of think back to that, that example of the basketball that you were talking about and, and iteration, as Jackie said, it's just the practice of jumping over and over and over that fence, right? It's building up some kind of internal reserve um, that is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of physical thing that you're doing. But it's also an imaginative thing, is that you you're you're rehearsing a physical way of doing something, but you're also you're placing yourself in a space where you are imagining the uses towards which you might put the skill that you are rehearsing over and over and over again, without necessarily closing it off from other things. I'm also kind of rambling here as well. Jay has that I had. No, I, I rehearsed things over and over uh, again in my mind yeah. of things that could have went better, from socially awkward mm. situations, being socially awkward. And so that puts you into a right zone when you have to play a, a moment out in so many different directions when you're rehearsing or you're playing a moment out on stage in front of people who've never seen this before in their lives. You already know what's the most exciting way to get from A to B to C to D to A to F, even if it's the most intimidating thing for you in a normal situation where everybody's eyes is on you. So it's just a, a question of how much do I want to raise the stakes sometimes and how much I, I really want to be honest. I remember back in Lispa, Thomas was suggesting that somebody was confident, but they were being shy for some reason. And I remember thinking confidence is a word that really involves trust, right? Hey, I'm letting you guys know everything about me in this moment. Can I, can I trust you? <laughs> you know, hey, can I, you know, let me confide something in you. So it just made me really realize what this, this, this relationship I have to an audience, if you can call it an audience, because I always feel like it's a participant too. But yeah, it just gives me all these ideas about performance. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Let me mm -hmm. shut up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jay Han? That um, just, it's interesting that you talk about prosthetics because that uh, idea about, uh, you know, why are we bothering to take our bodies across space? Uh, when I came up with the Elon Musk uh, conversation, literally came from this idea of uh, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. Mm. And the idea that we have been social beings that have been using technology from day one, if you go back to sapiens, if you go back to everything that is now conventional mainstream sort of, you know, understanding the human condition, because um, I seem to get all my articulation from there, um, it, it is this. Um, and therefore, it, this just the prosthetics thing just reminded me about like how we are not purely, I mean, let's just look at mask. We wear like, you know, just using mask, right? That was the first, like it's a prosthetic we use in theater to do something, to have something, use something, et cetera, et cetera. And so then you go, 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 go. And then now this is mask or beyond. And then what is beyond this moment? And then I come back and I just think, what are we, what are we translating into the continuum? And I just had a side chat with Amy because I feel like we have come so far in terms of our understanding of what is important. And Jackie, when you said it, is touch the most important thing? You know, you suddenly decentered it and said it's just a, one thing amongst many. And at least that's what I got out of it. And, and then um, I just wonder about like some of the conversations in the first season where there was this like an adamance of like the importance of the physical physicality. And I just wonder about how they're going to... Uh, how people in those first conversations would see this conversation now, because we've traveled a long way since, here, since then. And then Amy said something about, you know, maybe it's about the importance of seeing. And I just, yeah, I think, I'm thinking it's about the experience. It's about the construction, the sharing, the crafting of experience. Mm -hmm. If I and can just, I don't want you to think that I don't think touch is important, right? No, 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 I, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just suggesting that we, that, that we, that we don't stick with touching in one way, that mm. there are multiple ways of touching and being touched. And, mm. and, and we realize that how, you know, like we, we that, and usually we, I'm, I'm going to the hands because that's how we, we touch. That's how we move around in dance with our hands and our feet. Right. And it's, um, and I'm, I'm suggesting that if we start reimagining the body, then something else could be like a hand. Something else could be used like we use our feet. Something else could be used like we use these eyes. It's about reimagining ourselves in order to reimagine the world, you know, and they kind mm -hmm. of, it kind of works together. So, um, 
I mean, it's, we need to, I mean, the, the, the digital age is even before, and if you think about it, it's even before this, this COVID moment that, the, the, um, that this has been a question. Like, you know, I know, for example, in South, when was it two years ago when we went through the, um, it started with a hashtag Me Too campaign. There, that whole touching thing that happened already. There's, there's this heightened thing of, of, of when you touch, who gets touched, who's looking, all of those kinds of oh, questions. Then we go to the gender-based violence, and we had terrible incidences that continue here in South Africa. And there was a moment that there were protests around that at universities and stuff. And we were holding space for the students, and they didn't want to have certain people touch them, like next to them at all. And this complete kind of sense of social distancing was actually happening before COVID already. And it's a problem. It's a real problem. The sense of not wanting to touch um, um, and, and, and kind of being hooked onto and then, and then shaming people through the digital space and, and all of that. It's been happening before COVID. It's just now mm -hmm. that we all kind of the people, you know, we've, so I think that, it's, that the touch is important. Um, and, and I do think that it's, that it's, that we kind of, I mean, I make my daughter, I touch her, <laughs> I force her to touch me. And to, so that's because, because we learn so much through touch, we learn yeah. through touch, right? So, but it's not just our hands that can touch. Um, and I think that that's, that's, I, I don't want to, to come across as saying that, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It means a lot. Um, it's just that I think we've been cornered into it meaning only one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, it's its now 17 minutes past the hour, and I just wanted to officially um, close off the first half of the conversation, and thank you everyone who has sat in. Um, as I said, we'll be going into the kind of more informal um, water cooler chat immediately afterwards, um, and I'm going to be continuing from there, and to the extent that that there is a kind of takeaway here, um, I just want to say, I guess, what I'm I'm learning, what I'm I'm being compelled to recognize is that these ways of working hopefully make us more open to experiencing, seeing, interacting with, being in the world differently, and that we must return again and again and again to the fault line in order to try and experience different ways of how to dance across it. And I want to embrace the word dance here and all of its rich, joyous, Kind of sense of the excess here, right? Is, is 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 finding that joy in in standing at the call face, is 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 finding that 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 pleasure, the frivolity, or the seeming frivolity of, of stepping up to the challenge, um, rather than feeling that we need to step to the side or, or away from simply because what we do doesn't seem to offer immediate tangible kind of um, solutions. There is something in, in stepping and dancing over that again and again that I find really, really attractive. Um, we're closed.